welcome. This is presentation number four in our series, Rereading the Fourth Gospel. This gospel tells the story of Jesus, the Revealer. And we are at the beginning of the story, uh, that's the part <coughs> that tells about the first disciples of Jesus in this gospel. And the transition from the prologue <coughs> to the narrative to the story part is quite abrupt here. <clears throat> this is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And <clears throat> John here is John the Baptist. He is a forerunner of the revealer. And here, this is a painting by Jan Steen, who is a Dutch painter, a little uh, time after Rembrandt, who will uh, <coughs> give us John the Baptist here in the middle, and uh, people who come to listen to him, and maybe these people here, the ones that, that are a little more sort of upscale, the way they are dressed, they are dressed in clothes that indicate importance. Maybe they could be, uh, represent those who come and <coughs> for this inquiry. So here we are in, <coughs> in the beginning of the story. It is quite abrupt and <coughs> it continues that way. <coughs> he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And here <coughs> we have we could make some observations. The story is told as though we are expected to know some things in advance. Yes, we know John a little from the prologue, but the story expects, expects, expects us to know even more than that. There is a kind of, you know, implication of some prior knowledge, maybe knowledge of the synoptics, uh, who knows. And then <clears throat> the world of Jesus and the world of Jewish belief are premises already in place, such as John the Baptist is a character that uh, in some ways we are uh, expected to know a little about. Certainly we are expected to know something about priests and Levites because the story doesn't explain it to us. It takes for granted <clears throat> that we know it. And then they came there, they had been sent by the Jerusalem leaders on an inquiry, and it sounds like an adversarial relationship from the beginning. So the inquiry, like the gospel itself, has an adversarial tenor, that there is something already from the beginning that isn't accepting of here John the Baptist and his story that will, uh, that will come. I have switched now from Jan Sten to Rembrandt. <clears throat> so this is even a step up, maybe. Uh, Rembrandt's uh, a depiction of John the Baptist here, uh, preaching, and even more characters around. And you can see we are <clears throat> not in the desert of Judea. We are uh, somewhere in Europe. But, <clears throat> but we get the idea. Uh, and the way he illuminates uh, John the Baptist is quite amazing. And we are discussing this question, who are you? So, <coughs> who are you? No idea who you might be. <coughs> that could be an option. Or who are you? Among a selection of predefined options. And of these two options, these two uh, answers to who are you, it's obviously that this is the correct one. There are some candidates already in place for who he might be. And <clears throat> he is then presenting himself as a, as a very significant figure. So, <clears throat> well, first,
first he says, I am not the Messiah. <laughs> Did someone think that he was? Did someone think that John the Baptist is the Messiah? It's hardly necessary to, to deny it if that was not an option in the first place. He confessed it. He did not deny it. He confessed. Why such a labored negation? Uh, so there must have been a, a that must, assume, we could assume that, that that option is relevant. Are you Elijah? So in the prophet <coughs> Malachi in the Old Testament, the last of the books in the old, last of the Old Testament books, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So there is an expectation in, pl in place for an Elijah-like figure to come. Are you that one? Or <coughs> are you the prophet? So <coughs> in the farewell days of Moses in the Old Testament, God says, I will send you a prophet like Moses. <coughs> so are you that one that will speak for me like Moses did, and you will listen to him. So we are in the thick of Jewish, Old Test uh, Jewish expectations based on the Old Testament. Now, how deeply held, how deep these expectations were in the time of, of Jesus and, and, and John the Baptist is, a, is debatable. Is John responding to expectations already there? Or is John the Baptist creating expectations? I tend to think that he is the one who creates expectations and may actually have revived those Old Testament texts in his own uh, day. <coughs> so, he will answer. <coughs> he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. This is very pointed. I'm not that one. I'm not that one. I'm not the Messiah. Well, who are you? <coughs> and then he answers, and under some pressure. And here is another depiction of John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. And here more in a sort of wilderness uh, scene. And uh, we have his dress also there. He was dressed in a certain way. He was dressed in the garb of Old Testament prophets. <coughs> so, so that is, is striking. <coughs> and then, <coughs> what now? So let's read that text. As the prophet Isaiah said, we, we read it here. As the prophet Isaiah said, and what did the prophet Isaiah says, say? A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. So a road is made for something to happen. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That is the self-understanding we get from John the Baptist. And a theme is announced here in the background text in, in uh, Isaiah. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And we cannot make too much of this in the context of Isaiah. So let's look at a summary of this, John's answer is not that he is only a minor figure among the Old Testament expectations. True, he says, I'm not Elijah. True, he says, I'm not the prophet, the Moses-like prophet. And he is not the Messiah. But he knows who he is. He is the forerunner of the revealer. That's who he is. And that is not a minor figure. And here's one more thing. His answer makes Isaiah a key background text in our approach to the fourth gospel. And you cannot make too much of that. So don't think he is saying, well, I'm just a nobody. He's not a nobody. He's a big one. And 
something is going to happen that is very, uh, very big. <coughs> so, moving on in our text. <coughs> now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? Those were the ones that they had sort of fastened their minds on. <coughs> John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. That's his answer. And again, there is a kind of miscomprehension here, a miscue as, uh, on the part of those who question him, because they think that he has made himself a small figure, but he hasn't, and that's their misunderstanding. And here is a comment by C.K. Barrett, who has written a very <coughs> influential commentary on the Gospel of John. It must not be inferred from the form of this question that either the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet was expected to baptize. The question rather means, why do you perform what appears to be an official act if you have no official status? This is the first reference to baptism. It is assumed that the readers will have been able to make the necessary connection. Just to explain, you know, what is the implication of the, of the baptizing thing. <laughs> Why does he baptize? Well, he will explain that himself in just a minute. <clears throat> We're back to our text. <clears throat> this took place in Bethany, across the Jordan where John was baptizing, and most likely we can locate this, and we just have to get used to it, that John likes to be specific with regard to place and time. So he will <coughs> keep us posted on where we are, uh, and here is the most likely location of where the story in John begins. Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. <coughs> okay, <coughs> so we go to day number two. I said that John is specific in regard to place and he is specific in regard to time because he will say the next day. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, look the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. So there is a forerunner and now there is a revealer. And he will point him out here in, uh, and he will name him. He will, the, this is the first title given to Jesus in the sort of narrative proper. So he calls him the Lamb of God. <coughs> and Candidates, options for that is Genesis 22, the story of Abraham Isaac, and Isaac, where Isaac will ask Abraham, where is the lamb? It could also refer to Exodus, the story of Exodus from Egypt, where there is a lamb sacrificed, the lamb that signifies liberation, freedom. And then Isaiah, not surprisingly, that we are back in the, in the territory of Isaiah like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And that is one of the descriptions of the revealer in the book of Isaiah. So we don't need to adjudicate strictly in favor of one or the other, but we cannot, we cannot uh, uh, mute Isaiah's voice. It doesn't mute or lower Isaiah's contribution to the story we are reading. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I really think that Joanne Brandt has a good, a good comment here, Joanne Brandt in her John commentary. Uh, so just to comment on taking away the sin of the world. What does, does it mean? I wish I could make a long comment, a, a longer comment than I will, but I just want to <clears throat> read what she says. The action of taking up taking up the sins of the world, lifting it. 
that action suggests an understanding of sin more ontological than psychological. Jesus does not here remove guilt. The sin of the world is failure, corruption, degradation. It is a dying, decaying thing. Jesus takes away death and brings life. So this is not strictly a moral uh, understanding of sin. And it isn't the understanding of sin, not yet, that will emerge later in the Gospel. But it's certainly worth thinking about her way of seeing it there. <coughs> okay, we read on. John the Baptist speaking. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason that he might be revealed to Israel. Why are you baptizing, they said. Here is the answer. I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit <coughs> descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And this still John the Baptist speaking, saying the same thing again. I myself did not know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So here we have the first confession of who Jesus is. The Lamb of God, yes, and now also and the Son of God in John the, Baptist, uh, John the Baptist's uh, uh, depiction. But this is a, this is a little bit of a, of a problem here, because he will say twice, I didn't know him. And we wonder what is missing here, because in the Gospel of Luke, in the first chapter, in a very long chapter in the Gospel of Luke, um, we have parallel birth stories of John the Baptist and Jesus. First, the story of how uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, John, the parents of John the Baptist, how their story and how John the Baptist is born. And then, <coughs> inside the same story, the story of Mary, who is pregnant to be the mother, become the mother of Jesus. So those stories are connected, and our problem is, how could John say he didn't know him? That's the issue. Why is that? Uh, that, is, that is a problem. So Elizabeth, in the Lucan story, Elizabeth and Mary are related to each other. They're relatives. And Mary visits Elizabeth while pregnant. And she stays there for three months. So the connections are visible, explicit, and strong. So why does John say, <coughs> uh, I didn't know him? So it, does our author, the author of the Gospel of John, doesn't he know that part of the story? Or is John the Baptist saying, I knew all of those things. I knew Mary and Elizabeth. I knew the connection. I know we are relatives. I know we have talked and talked, and this has been a subject in our families for years. I still didn't know. There was a sort of barrier to knowing that the, the prior conceptions were inadequate for the reality that came eventually. It seems to me worth pausing and thinking about that. Of course, some artist figured it out and put it together. Here is Mary with her child, Jesus' child. And here is the old Elizabeth who gets pregnant late in life with John the Baptist. And, and, and the artist thinks they, they have met and, known, and are known to each other. Enough about that. Let's move on in the story. <coughs> the next day... And John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, <coughs> the Lamb of God. And here, uh, let's look at this illustration. Maybe 
this is from about 1650 or so and we have John the Baptist and and standing with his disciples and he is pointing out something I actually think that this illustration works best for the first time that uh, he sees uh, that he sees Jesus but you have to do compromise in, a, in, in works of art and where is Jesus well he is walking here off by himself here at some distance so that's why I think you know maybe this was the first time he sees Jesus at some distance but here the second time he is standing with his disciples and we need to get that in in, uh, in two so twice now he will say uh, uh, look <coughs> Uh, the Lamb of God <coughs> and uh, now something will happen there will be a response here it's day three in the story the two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus when Jesus turned and saw them following he said to them what are you looking for they said to him rabbi which trans which translated means teacher where are you staying? Perfectly innocuous question. He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying. And they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. It's an indelible memory. It's an indelible never to be forgotten memory. That's how I think we should see it. <coughs> Indelible memories do exist, like 9-11. It's a 9-11 memory. You know where you were, what, you, what happened. You can sort of recapitulate it. You might know the hour of day more easily than you know which day of the week. Because those types of memories declare themselves more that way. So it was about four o'clock in the afternoon is by that criterion a very telling thing. And I would like to just remind us again of Eric Auerbach, <clears throat> the way he describes the character of the Gospels, the spirit of rhetoric, that is to say creative writing creative speech making <clears throat> the spirit of rhetoric a spirit which, uh, which classified subjects in genera and invested every subject with a specific form of style as the one garment becoming it becoming it in virtue of its nature could not extend its dominion to them to the gospels bible writers for the simple reason that their subject could not fit into any of the known genres. So, is this a creative writer? He said, I should put in something, time of the hour of day. It's not that kind of writing. It is really someone who is a writer against his plans or career, uh, and he just remembers it, and it has the texture of an eyewitness uh, memory a sort of flash of lightning <coughs> that strikes and this fits the story of the revealer. <coughs> One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. How does Jesus know that he is Simon, son of John? Well, he must have talked some to Andrew, and Andrew must have told him, I have a brother. You know, so <clears throat> there is a sort of background there. This is knowable because of prior contact. And here we have... Uh, a uh, depiction of, of this first first coming to Jesus uh, like that. <coughs> so the next day, day number four, <coughs> Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. 
Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael somewhat incredulously said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, Nazareth is not on the map. Philip said to him, Come and see. And again, we are kept abreast of where we are. So the next day, day four, he decides to go from here and then go to Galilee. And here he, those two of those, uh, Peter was from there, from Bethsaida, and here we also have that <coughs> little town put on the map for us. And things are very specific in this gospel as we are uh, learning. <clears throat> when Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to, of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And these are huge leaps of perception. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? To this one, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. <coughs> so what <coughs> we need to, to ask a few questions here. Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. <laughs> so is that because Jesus has superior sources of information that in some flash of revelation he sees Nathaniel? Or is it because he has superior powers of observation? Because he actually saw some things. He was observant. He sees all kinds of things that a deeply engaged person will see and a superficial person will miss. That option is also there. You cannot rule that out. And then <clears throat> we have Old Testament texts echoing in the background here as to the significance of this encounter. This innocuous little fig tree has an Old Testament antecedent. They shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Sitting under the fig tree is what happens after the revelation has run its course and we are now safe. Or here in Zechariah, in that day says the Lord of hosts, you shall invite each other to come under your vine and fig tree. So the Old Testament background text here, they some echo, echo softly in our text. Jesus answered, <coughs> End of day four. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And again, let's just get used to it. All kinds of Old Testament texts echoing in this book. This is the dream of Jacob in Genesis 28. The dream of Jacob as he is fleeing home <coughs> to go to an unknown, uncertain future. He dreams that there is a ladder from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and there are angels going up and down. <coughs> now Jesus takes ownership of that text and says that <coughs> the ladder is him, and the ladder is it's like heaven has established a foothold on earth. Heaven stands now on earth in the person of the Son of Man, who is now become an earthling and is the means of connection. <coughs> so, uh, now I want to <coughs> do a couple of rereader perspectives on the beginning before we summarize. So, rereader perspective on the beginning looking at some of the things that we have just barely talked about so far 
So we will revisit a few of our texts and see what we get. <clears throat> the next day we heard, he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The word of interest is look. It's a common word, nothing to it. And the Gospel of John has so many uh, instances where it uses that word that uh, it's almost beyond computation. <clears throat> the next day, as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, the Lamb of God. So these are, this is sort of what happens at the beginning, calling attention to Jesus from someone who is in the know. <clears throat> We're moving, skipping toward the end of the Gospel. And Jesus is now on trial. He is in some ways the embodiment of the Lamb of God, who is abused before his perse uh, persecutors, similar to what Isaiah will say about the Lamb in Isaiah 52 and 53. So they have been <coughs> torturing him, and Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. P Pilate said to him, Look, the man. And Pilate is almost now in this gospel a John the Baptist, Baptist-like figure, a figure like John the Baptist, who will say almost the same thing as John the Baptist says at the beginning, maybe participating unknowingly in calling attention to the revealer. Just think about that possibility. And the word then is to look, and that is a key word in the story. Another rereader perspective here from the beginning, chapter 1, he said to them, come and you will see, come and see Jesus answering the two disciples of John the Baptist, come and see, where are you staying? And here Nathaniel <coughs> said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He said to Philip. Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus says to them, come and see. Philip picks it up and also says, come and see. Same thing. And then <coughs> Jesus will later in our story go to Samaria. And the Samaritan woman at the end of their conversation will say, come and see a man who told me everything that I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah. Can he? And <coughs> come and see are now a message in the book repeated more than once. <coughs> we are continuing here <coughs> on rereader perspective. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? The word stay is now the word of interest. The Greek word is meno, the verb is meno, poumenes, they ask him. <coughs> He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying. Pu mene, same thing. And they stayed with him that day. This is perfectly everyday talk. Where are you staying? Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him. There's nothing to it. Nothing theologically to it. Until you read later in the story. Same word. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you stay in my word, you are truly my disciples. Same verb. Stay, he would say in a farewell address about uh, when he talks about the vine and the branches. Stay in me as I in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it stays in the vine, neither can you unless you stay in me. So we move from the innocuous, sort of non-theological <coughs> meaning of staying. Where are you staying? And suddenly we have deep theological implications of the same word later in the story. <coughs> so, stay. Look. Come and see. Stay. Those are words suggested to us and we're ready for a review <coughs> the first disciples in review <coughs> number one john the baptist looms large in the story 
the first disciples of Jesus had been disciples of John the Baptist. That's unique to the Gospel of John. We don't, do not know that from the other, from the synoptics. Uh, in John, Jesus' first encounter with Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, and an unnamed companion of Andrew happens at Bethany beyond the Jordan. Names, time and place, and maybe a little suspicion that that unknown disciple <coughs> could be one who gets further attention later in the story. So, readers are kept abreast of people, places, and time. And an indelible, I will call it first high-end memory, it was four o'clock in the afternoon. That's the indelible memory. In a re-reader perspective, <coughs> ordinary words, common words such as look, come, and stay, turn out to be theme words in the gospel. It's proof of the gospel's ability to turn everyday granite into theological gold. I wish I could say this in better language. It would be Norwegian. I'll say it in Norwegian too. Or for grå stein till å bli gull. Vanlig grå stein blir teologisk gull. Let me say it in that language too. I'm sorry. <coughs> Among the options offered readers at the outset, <coughs> these words, <coughs> look, come and see and stay. Among the options offered readers at the outset, we can do no better <coughs> than choose the one that now suits our needs best. Come and see. <coughs> 